So welcome to today's session. We'll be talking a bit about pleural fusion, so in specific, the causes, how we diagnose it, investigations that we can order, and how to interpret those, and how we can manage pleural effusions. So our next page, we're going to talk about pathophysiology. So what is pleural effusion? It is known as the accumulation of fluid within our pleural cavity. So within our lung, there is two layers, as we can see, of foldings that cover the lung. So one, it's very adherent to the lung itself. This is called visceral pleura. And the one outside it is called parietal pleura. So visceral is pretty much part of the lung, while parietal pleura is the one in, um, surrounding it. It's normal to have a bit of pleural fluid between these two layers. So where do they come from? So here we've got the parietal pleura on the left, the visceral on the right. So here's our pleural space. So as it's part, as the visceral is kind of part of the lung, we've got our pulmonary capillaries. Here's our alveola with our lungs, and this is where gas exchange occurs. On the left hand side, we've got a parietal pleura. It's got our systemic capillaries. So because there is some fluid that comes from these capillaries during these exchanges. So the, both of these contribute to the pleural fluid. Another source of pleural fluid also comes from the peritoneal cavity, so from the abdomen. So how does this occur? Well, there are tiny spaces in the diaphragm. So we've got an abdomen below here. And we've got tiny gaps between a diaphragm where the fluid can enter from the abdomen or the peritoneal cavity. So these are three main ways of how pleural fluid originates from. And how is it cleared? Because there has to be a clearance system. We've got our lymphatic system that's involved in that. So when we have abnormalities in these system, whether there's too much production or decreased clearance, this is when we ha can have an accumulation of fluid causing pleural effusion. So let's talk about the terms that we're going to be using today. There's transudate and exudate. So what is transudate fluid? This is pleural fluid that permeates through the intact pulmonary vessels. So the vessels itself are fine, they're normal there's a pressure problem that's causing the fluid to occur. So as you can see in most of our vessels, so here's our vessel, there is gonna be hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure um, is responsible for allowing a shift from the intravascular space to the outside. So it allows fluid to escape the capillaries. Oncotic pressure, is responsible for drawing the fluid into the, into the capillaries. So they work opposite direction. So let's say we have increased hydrostatic pressure. So there's increased pressure trying to push everything out. And when can this occur? Heart failure. Another cause is decreased oncotic pressure. So oncotic pressure is when it draws it, our fluid into the vessels itself. And, what can, and what's responsible for oncotic pressure? Proteins. So when we have decreased proteins, such as in cirrhosis, liver failure, or nephrotic syndromes, so kidney issues, we can have decreased oncotic pressure, and therefore that pulling force is less, and therefore fluid can escape into the interstitial spaces. So that's our transudate. It's a pressure problem. Exudate is when there's abnormalities in the vessels itself rather than the pressure system. So when there is inflammation, infections, or tumors, it can lead to vessels becoming more permeable. It becomes more leaky, and therefore large proteins and fluids can escape into our interstitial spaces and cause pleural effusions. It's very important to know that large proteins is much more difficult to remove by our lymphatic system and therefore can stay longer in the um, fluid. Meanwhile, in transudate, you don't really see those proteins because it's mainly the fluid due to that pressure difference. So transudate, exudate. So in terms of clinical presentation, how do these patients present? If it's less than 300 milliliters, 
they're often asymptomatic and they don't actually have any symptoms at all. Once it gets more than that, they can complain of dyspnea, shortness of breath, so pleuritic pain, and non-productive cough. And this is due to a collapse of the lung or less space for the lung to expand in due to the fluid that's already in there. Furthermore, they could have symptoms of any underlying causes. So if there's fever, cachexia, we've got to think about whether what are the different sorts of causes. So fever might be thinking whether it's a pneumonia-associated effusion or whether it's a PE-associated effusion. If it's cachexia, maybe there is a malignancy-associated effusion. Or if there's symptoms of left-sided heart failure as well, that could be causing the effusion. In clinical examination, we might see an asymmetrical expansion, so decreased expansion on this side of the lung. So this is our right lung, so it'll be decreased expansion on the right. We'll have reduced vocal resonance over the area. So over the area, once we are asking the patient to say 99, we might hear a reduced vocal resonance due to that fluid that's there, allowing, making sound harder to travel through the chest. When we percuss with our fingers, we're gonna hear a dull, and in specific, a stony dull percussion due to that fluid, um, rather than the air, which gives a nice um, percussing sound. We might hear reduced breath sounds, which makes sense because there's no lung in that area. And in some instances, we can hear pleural friction rub. So why did we talk about transudate and exudate? So remember, transudate's our pressure issue, well, exudate is more due to the permeability of our um, abnormalities in our capillaries. It's because they have different causes. So remember, this is a pressure issue. So therefore, heart failure. Um, cirrhosis, so this is when we have decreased oncotic pressure. So hepatic cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, when we have protein losing enteropathy, enteropathy and chronic kidney disease. So this is all related to our um, oncotic pressures or well, this may be related to our hydrostatic pressure. Exudative, so this is when we're thinking about infections, malignancies, and inflammation. So we can have infection. So effusions associated with pneumonias, um, TB, and empyema when it becomes infected after a pneumonia, or parasitic infections. We could have malignancies. These can be primary or secondary. So it can be a primary lung cancer, or it could be secondary as well, metastatic spread from the breast cancer, lymphomas, and mesotheliomas, so malignancy of the pleural lining, and ovarian cancer. So why would ovarian cancer, isn't that in the abdomen? Well, remember how some fluid can actually come through the gaps of our diaphragm? Ovarian cancer can lead to ascites and a fluid in our peritoneal cavity, which can then later lead to associated pleural effusions. So pulmonary embolism is also a known cause of this as well. And again, our inflammatory causes, so autoimmune. Uh, pancreatitis is an important cause. Again, that fluid from that diaphragm that can enter into our chest cavity. So hemothorax, that's blood in terms of our pleural um, space. And there is also chylothorax and pseudochylothorax, which we might talk about in a lot of that later session. So chylothorax is when we have high triglycerides and high chylomicrons. So chylomicrons are lipids that are taken up from our gut through our lymphatic system. And when we have maybe obstruction to this lymphatic system through maybe a mass obstructing it or surgery or trauma, it can lead to an accumulation of these chylomicrons and triglycerides in our chest cavity. Pseudochylothorax is similar to chylothorax, but it's not caused at all by chylomicrons or triglycerides, but it's rather caused by inflammation. A good way to differentiate this is to get a sample of this pleural fluid, which we'll talk a bit about later, and see differences in our lipid levels. And I'll talk more about this later, but very important to note that exudative and transudative and no various causes of it. All right, how do we diagnose it? So a chest x-ray is very important and we can see some key signs, blunting of the costophrenic angle, homogeneous density with a meniscal sign, 
And if it's really large, the effusion can actually push some of our structures in our chest. It can lead to mediastinal shifts. The heart can actually shift. And also the trachea can also deviate to the opposite side. We can use ultrasound. It can show us hypoechoic or anechoic structures. It's very sensitive and it's a much quicker assessment, especially as a bedside tool. And CT chest um, is very um, useful as well. And it can detect very small levels of fluid that could be mixed by, missed by a chest X-ray or even an ultrasound in some instances. Diagnostic thoracentesis is our gold standard. So this is when we take a sample of the fluid in our pleural cavity. This might not be done in all sorts of cases. This is because if we know that someone's got heart failure and they've had an exacerbation of their heart failure and then they've now got fluid, fluid in their pleural cavity, we would unlikely go and take a sample um, and of this pleural fluid. However, if there was a different sort of history, maybe it's not resolving, or when we're suspecting an underlying malignancy or other causes that we are unsure of, then a diagnostic thoracentesis may be appropriate. So it's all based on our clinical history. So here's our chest x-rays. So both of them actually have pleural effusions, but the one on the right, can you see that there's a blunting of the costophrenic angle and see how sharp this one is? Meanwhile, this one is quite blunted. And there's a nice meniscal sign as well that shows us a meniscal sign is that concave deformity in that fluid level. Meanwhile, in this one, we've got a much larger left-sided effusion. So again, you can see that meniscal sign. It's hard to appreciate the, um, so the mediastinal does seem to be shifted, but it's hard to appreciate because we don't actually know the borders, but it does seem to be shifted across to the right-hand side. A trachea is still midline, as you can see, but again, a very large um, sided, and you can see that homogenous stru um, structure that we're seeing in that chest X-ray. In terms of ultrasound, so um, ignore the ones and twos, because it's not associated with these ones. So here we can see, so both of them are demonstrating a plural effusion. So as you can see, it's quite outlined per clearly right here. So we've got, can you see this is moving up and down? This white structure, that's our diaphragm as we're inspirating and expirating. And this structure under here, as you can see, so this is our superior, this is our inferior superior inferior so we've got to adjust ourselves to the diagram and as you can see inferiorly this is where our spleen would be and you can see that um, nice structure outlined over here now there's the black usually we don't see anything above the diaphragm due to the reflection of the waves air doesn't conduct ultrasound very well and therefore we will see an acoustic shadowing. So we'll see a mirroring effect of the spleen. So after we see the spleen, the diaphragm, we then see whatever's inferior to the diaphragm, we'll see that again on the top. But here we can see the lung very clearly. So this is an abnormal thing that we're seeing the lung. So there's black structures here. This is all pleural effusion. The lung is that shaking sign. So can you see it's swimming like a jellyfish? similar to a jellyfish, that's called the jellyfish sign. So it's our collapsed lung that is kind of bathing in that pleural effusion. Below, we've also got a large pleural effusion. All this black, we shouldn't be seeing it. So it's all fluid. Here again, we've got our lung and this bright white structure is called our thoracic spine. So this is a thoracic spine sign. So normally we wouldn't see this structure at all over here, but because of the fluid, it allows ultrasound waves to transmit through this um, fluid much easily. And we're able to visualize these structures more clearly as well. So this is where we would place our ultrasounds in both sides to determine for pleural effusion, making sure that we pointing upwards for superior and inferiorly. And we can use the markings on our ultrasound to adjust ourselves as well. So diagnostic 
um, thorough synthesis. So when taking a sample of that flow of fluid, our main idea is, is it a transudative or is it an exudative? A very important criteria that we use is called lights criteria. And we only have to satisfy one of the following. So what, are, what is it? So pleural fluid protein to serum protein ratio is more less than 0.5 in transudative or more than 0.5. And we know that in exudative, we are expected to see that more protein due to the leakiness of the capillaries. Again, similar pleural fluid LDH to serum LDH is less than 0.6 and more than 0.6. So LDH is lactate dehydrogenase and it's elevated in cell damage or death. So an exudative are more likely to see lung and pleural damage and also damage to the endothelial cells, um, therefore more likely to see elevation in that as well. And third criteria is pleural fluid LDH is less than or more than two thirds of the upper limit of the normal serum LDH. Other things that we can look at pleural fluid is the appearance. If it's clear, it's more likely to be transudative. If it's purulent, it kind of indicates our causes as well. We can look at the pH and the glucose, and we can also use cell count differentiation and um, hematocrit levels as well, checking for hemothorax or blood. Gram stain and culture is important in when we're suspecting organisms. Cytology, so looking at the cells for malignancy or even abnormalities in the cells could indicate autoimmune conditions as well. So lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. We'll look at the lipid levels. So when we have elevated triglycerides and chylomicrons, what that's thinking whether this may be a chylothorax um, or when, when it's when it's the total cholesterol is elevated, but the triglycerides is not, it might be a pseudo chylothorax. So very important to differentiate between those as well. And these would have a more milky, milk white appearance in terms of our pleural fluid. Amylase level is very important, especially in pancreatitis, but there's also a few other causes as well. And immunology. So you can actually get ANA levels, complement levels, and um, rheumatoid so RA factor, so for checking for rheumatoid arthritis, and they are associated with pleural effusions as well. So now that we've diagnosed it, how do we manage it? It all depends on the underlying cause. If it's transudative, if it's heart failure, we can think about diuretics and trying to get rid of that fluid. Um, if it is SLE or an autoimmune cause, we might think about steroids to try to um, suppress that acute flare or exacerbation. So it all depends on the underlying cause. We could consider therapeutic thoracosynthesis. So you know how we take a sample um, to check, um, analyze the fluid itself. We can actually take some of that fluid for symptom relief and as a therapeutic measure. So we can, as you can see, they aim at the upper border of that effusion. And when we go one to two intercostal space down, we don't wanna be careful to go too lower as we can actually enter the abdominal cavity instead. So after you go one to two intercostal spaces, you would aim above the rib. So we, it's important to aim above the rib because below the rib, we've got some important structures like our intercostal vein, our arteries and our nerves that run underlying the nerve. So make sure you aim up above the rib and you would use lidnocaine as a pain relief as well and would enter through that and get a sample of the pleural fluid. Very important to only drain slowly. So 0 0.5 to 1.5 liters over 24 hours. If we take too much, it creates like a negative vacuum and allows the lung to expand too quickly and uh, increases the chance of having pulmonary edema. So as the lung expands too quickly, if you take the fluid out, it draws in fluid and then starts, you can get a re-expansion pulmonary edema. So very important to slowly remove the fluid. And we, there's some other procedures as well that we can discuss for specialty consultation. So I'll talk about that. So there's three kind of main ways. You can put a tube in. 
So this is when you're having recurrent pleural effusions. You don't want to keep on draining fluid through that previous method. Or if there's infected or loculated infections, so loculated as in contained infections, we can use a tube using uh, indwelling catheter that we can put into the pleural cavity, and this can sit in there for quite some time. We can use video-assisted thoroscopic surgery. So as you can see, it's a minimal, minimally invasive surgery, and we can actually use it for diagnostic purposes as well. We can take a sample of the pleural um, lining. We can also use it to drain empyemas or adhesions or scar tissues. And we can also use it mainly if the previous one, putting a tube has failed. And then we can also discuss pleurodesis. So the problem is that, the whole problem is that there's fluid within this visceral and pleural cavity. What if this space never existed? So we can actually close these spaces up together. There's two ways we can go about it. We can chemically do it. So you can use talc powder and we can put this through a tube and put powder in and it irritates these lining and causes um, a fusion between these two linings or strictures. Or we can surgically obliterate the space as well. So we can actually remove this lining as well. So this is indicated when there's recurrent effusions or malignant effusions or when you're treating a particular fusion like heart failure and it's not responsive to medication at all. So that's another useful method. So I think that concludes the session on um, plural effusion. Thank you so much for listening and I hope it was helpful. If you have any ideas for any future ideas, let me know down in the comments, like and subscribe and stay tuned for the next one. All right, see you everyone. <laughs>